Welcome to UO Today. My name is Paul Pepys. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Cheryl Harris, the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the UCLA School of Law. She teaches constitutional law, civil rights, employment discrimination, critical race theory, and race conscious remedies. Harris's work addresses the interconnections between racial theory, civil rights practice, politics, and human rights. She was a main organizer of several major conferences that helped establish a dialogue between U.S. legal scholars and South African lawyers during the development of South Africa's first democratic constitution. Harris gave the UO School of Law's Derek Bell Lecture on February 19, 2019. Her talk, titled Affirmative Action Chronicles, From the Era of Colorblindness to White Nationalism, was part of this year's African American Workshop and Lecture Series. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Tell us a bit about your background and how you wound up pursuing a career in the law and as a professor of law. Well, I think like many people, I was attracted to law because I was interested in pursuing a career that um, could help with achieve social justice. And when I came out of law school, I practiced for a number of years and was a little bit restless uh, looking for a place where I thought I could make a difference. I was fortunate to have a number of wonderful mentors and people who taught me quite a bit. I did criminal defense work for a while and then I <clears throat> was became part of the law, um, the corporation city's attorney's office at the time when the late Harold Mayor, Harold Washington of Chicago was first elected mayor, the first black mayor of the city of Chicago in a lot of ways. Um, I mark that as a signal point, not only in the lives of sort of Chicagoans, but I think in terms of black politics. Um, and so during that period, I was remained active in a number of organizations and um, was very interested, as I said, in trying to expand the horizons of the law. Uh, a lot of things, I think, um, led to my actually turning in that direction, but a number of people suggested that since I was interested in writing and I had been doing a little bit of writing that I would consider teaching law. Um, immediately before I started teaching, however, though, I applied for and got accepted to an LLM program at the University of London in human rights. And partly that was because a lot of the work that I was doing at the time was on the sanctions movement against South Africa. and. Um, I was very much interested in the international dimension of law. That was the other reason why I was thinking about going to London. And as things turned out, uh, another path opened up before I came to London, and I found myself teaching uh, in Chicago, in my hometown. And um, part, part of the way that that happened had to do with, I think, some of the ramifications of what was happening in legal education more broadly. Um, it was around that time where Derek Bell uh, and others had started to raise questions about um, the need to desegregate the legal academy, if you will. Uh, and while there certainly had been some movement, um, it was a period where I think there was a lot of pressure coming both from within the academy as well as from outside of it. And so I think that all of that led to that um, moment, and I was very, very happy to start teaching, even though I hadn't necessarily started out thinking that that was where I would end up. Hmm, interesting. So you mentioned Derek Bell. You're here giving the Derek Bell lecture. Mm -hmm. You've just started to tell us a little bit about Derek Bell. Say a little bit more about why he's such a, an important figure in the history of American law. Yeah, Derek um, was, um, the, the, the word trailblazer gets overused quite a bit, but he really was. And um, at the time that he became the, one of the first um, tenured faculty at, uh, black faculty at Harvard Law School, uh, there were very, very few. And um, Derek's approach to law was very much informed by his experience as a civil rights lawyer. He had been one of the generation of lawyers that had been in the wake of Charles Hamilton Houston and others that had done the groundbreaking work around Brown. Uh, Derek was that next generation that came in and was involved with the implementation of Brown. And in the context of that, I think it made Derek very acutely aware of the distinction between the law and the books and the law and action. The ways in which um, one can secure rights on paper, but actually finding them to have meaning in the lives of everyday people is a, is a bigger and deeper struggle. 
And so when he entered the legal academy, I think he brought that sensibility with him. Um, he was not satisfied to sort of teach the four corners of the doctrine. His, uh, his instinct was to interrogate it. And by the time that I came along, he had already published a couple of very um, important texts, including one that I really remember quite well, um, And We Are Not Saved, uh, which is a series of stories, chronicles, if you will, in which he uses a set of imaginary conversations between himself and a character by the name of Geneva Crenshaw to pose a lot of questions about the dilemmas around race in American law. And so uh, I was fortunate enough to meet him um, when he came to Chicago to do a book signing. And as was wont for Derek to do, um, just sort of picking up uh, on the fact that I was a new law professor and somebody that was very keen to learn, he sat down and talked with me um, as a peer. He, he treated my ideas with respect. And um, I was completely, felt completely supported by him as I think many of us did coming into the academy at that time. And it, it launched an ongoing 20-year conversation, set of interactions, and I'm not, I'm not alone in that. I think if you talk to many people along the way, they felt they had that kind of opportunity to engage with him. But he was, um, he was something of a provocateur. He was very funny. Um, he was also uh, somebody who took the question of black liberation and racial equality very seriously. And his willingness to um, push the envelope in terms of uh, doing what he thought was right was also, I think, a hallmark of who he was as a man. Uh, in terms of his intellectual legacy, he's one of the founders and fathers of what we now refer to as critical race theory. Yes. Can you give us a kind of quick overview of what critical race theory is about and what it does and what its approaches are? Yes, certainly. Um, Derek, uh, as well as several others, are uh, maybe one, what, what might be thought of as precursors. Um, and what critical race theory was really um, emerged from was a set of debates um, within law and social movements about the post-Brown era. So if we think about the um, period of the Second Reconstruction, which is the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act, all of these things that came about through uh, tremendous struggle and social movement, these legislative products that come out of this period, um, the period of, of retrenchment, really, of the 70s, of the Reagan years, where enforcement uh, was actually abandoned, uh, and there became a kind of counter civil rights uh, movement, not only outside on the streets, but in the law. Um, the question was, what should be the response to this? And there were a number of debates in the legal academy um, that were quite critical of the way in which law was taught as though it was value or neutral free. And there were a body of people that were working in that arena. But critical race theory sort of wanted to take up that same question and center it around the question of race. In what ways do we see that the structure of the law, that the way in which the rules of the game are set up, so to speak, um, tell us about or st structure the way in which, legitimate the way in which race and racism work? Uh, we often have, a, I think, what um, some of my colleagues and I call a kind of simple progress narrative mm -hmm. in which we think that there was Plessy, um, that was bad, separate but equal, then there was Brown, which overturned it, and then we've been on, on a sort of long, slow, maybe slow, but trajectory upward towards uh, greater racial equality. And in fact, that period was, any, was evidence that it was anything but. And it suggested that the standard account of law really needed to be reexamined. Uh, we really needed to dig a lot deeper, both from the aspect of disciplines, that is to bring to bear other disciplines into law so that we could understand law as not just a product of uh, legal institutions, but as a product of society as a whole. 
uh, and understand that interface, the way in which law was both a tool for fighting racial oppression and also continue to be a tool for its implementation. So critical race theory really takes up that interaction and uh, probably in about the early 90s is when one might mark its emergence, its sort of self-identification as such. But certainly you could trace its, its strands back further. And uh, through a series of workshops and publications, it emerged out of that conversation. So one of those publications is an article that you wrote for the Harvard Law Review, published in 1993, called Whiteness as Property. Yes. And in fact, you looked very much at this uh, move, moment before up to Plessy and then from Plessy to Brown and then after Brown. Yes. So you tell us, if you can, um, give us a sense of the argument of whiteness as property. What, what does it mean to say that whiteness is property in the law? Well, I came to this idea not entirely sort of uh, full blown out of my head. As many good ideas sometimes happen, surprisingly, or not, they come out of teaching. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I was teaching constitutional law, I was teaching Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, which appears in most common law textbooks, very tiny little excerpt, uh, it sort of gives you the basic facts. And I was struck, I, I was at that period where I thought I had to read the entire opinions, even though I didn't teach the entire opinions to the class. That's a whole nother question as to why in law we do it that way. Mm. Uh, but I read the entire opinion and was struck by the fact that one of the claims that Plessy was making was that not just that the separation on the basis of race on the train cars in Louisiana constituted a violation of equal protection, but he also was making an argument that as a fair-skinned black man, uh, he enjoyed the reputation of being perceived as white, and that when the railroad conductor refused him access to the whites only car, it's actually the ladies car, which is a whole nother uh, story. Mm. When he was denied access to the car to the car reserved for whites, it deprived him of the reputation of being regarded as white, and that reputation was a property interest, and that it amounted to, in effect, the state taking his property without due process of law. Well, I became fascinated by this argument. Mm -hmm. uh, I started digging into this argument further, and the more I dug into it, the more I began to see that. Um, it had its antecedents in the way in which property itself has been conceptualized and defined in American law both before Plessy mm -hmm. and the way in which whiteness has functioned as a an exclusive category, um, excluding all others, which as it turns out is one of the principal aspects of a right of property. When you say you have a right of property, that means you have the right, at least in the liberal property regime, to exclude somebody else from taking that property. So this nucleus, if you will, of a kind of concept of a right to exclude mm -hmm. seemed to me to be really central to understanding certain dimensions of American law that pertain not only to the history of blacks, but also to the history of Native American people. Uh, because if you think about the very land upon which we sit uh, and the ways in which it was expropriated, um, that all has to do with the way in which property was defined as essentially um, something that belonged to the dominant class. So um, that was the genesis, really, of that article. So one of the things that's most fascinating about the argument of the article is that, you know, I think it's widely believed that Brown versus the Board of Education corrects the error mm -hmm. of Plessy. Mm -hmm. You make a very interesting argument there about that there is this correction that that Brown uh, implements, but that this that it shifts the construction of whiteness as property. It does not eliminate that construction. You want to explain that part sure. of the argument? Sure. Um, Brown was a remarkable achievement. Um, part of the reason that I think I sit here today has to do with uh, the fact that Brown did what it did, um, but. Uh, Law is, uh, is a complex uh, set of rules and procedures, and it's also an ideological, meaning it's a set of ideas. Um, and so what I was trying to look at was that while doctrinally there was a certain way in which Brown had repudiated uh, Plessy's idea that 
racial separation could constitute equality, what it, what it presumed in doing so, uh, and in fact in the language of the opinion itself, it says, um, assuming equal facilities, um, is it still the case that separation on the basis of race is unconstitutional? Well, the right answer to that is yes, but the problem is in the front end assumption, which is the assumption of equal facilities or the assumption of equal resources. And it's that presumption or assumption, which was really, for the most part, not disturbed, at least by Brown itself, in which I argue that the perpetuation of a certain kind of racial hierarchy continued. And so you have the period, the 50 years following Brown, of a lot of contestation and fight over the efforts to implement desegregation. But once again, because of the underlying structure of inequality, how schools were funded, where people were allowed to live and be, was not um, really disrupted. Uh, there were certain ways in which the law carried forward, even as it changed. Even as it changed, it carried forward a certain kind of set of hierarchical relationships. So uh, the end of the article focuses on affirmative action, mm -hmm. both as a, 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 an area where um, there's still evidence of this uh, whiteness as property mm -hmm. thinking obtains, but also you, you uh, speculate on ways that affirmative action might be transformed to more effectively actually address the legacies uh, of racism that um, Brown did, in fact, not adequately address. Mm -hmm. So, the the um, you're speaking on the topic of affirmative action yes. uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, will you say a little bit about flaws in the way that U.S. law has interpreted affirmative action that um, accounts for its the limitations on those ways that have continue to allow um, the problems of oppression despite the fact that affirmative action was yet another remedy meant to address that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, one of the things that's quite uh, clear to me, I think after so many years of looking at this, is that affirmative action can be used to describe a set of specific policies, but it actually has come to stand for much more than that. It's come to encompass the idea about what do we think, what role do we think race should play in, in policy, public policy. Um, and so partly what I see is that uh, both at the level of thinking about it as public policy as well as at the broader, I guess, idea or concept level about what do we think race should, when do we think race should be taken into account in terms of public policy. Um, one of the overarching, I think, presumptions that stands through the uh, affirmative action jurisprudence, which I should say, you know, just as a footnote, is some of the most entangled, contentious, 150 page long in the U.S. Supreme Court reports. Uh, why is it so divided? Why is it so hard to come to agreement about anything here? Mm -hmm. um, is partly it's because there is an underlying presumption that Affirmative action itself is the only moment at which race is actually operating within a system of decision making or resource allocation. The assumption seems to be that the system is race neutral in terms of its intention, effects, rules, and that affirmative action is the thing that is inserting race into an otherwise race neutral landscape. That's the premise that I contest. That's the premise that I think is the one that the Supreme Court often promotes, that, uh, but that if you scratch the surface, oh, but just a little bit, the question of the origins of these rules, the effects of these rules, sometimes the actual terms of these rules are anything but race neutral, uh, and they are in fact set up to uh, preserve privilege for those that have it, um, both racial and economic privilege, uh, and um, that affirmative action, which was, um, in, in, I guess to put it in one way, was designed to think about one mechanism for equalizing treatment, not just equal treatment, but what would it mean to equalize, um, that it becomes the flashpoint for a lot of um, disputation over or disputes over 
the question of race, but again, it's against this backdrop assumption that with Brown, um, race as a factor in terms of resource, life choices, life opportunities is pretty much uh, off, off the table uh, and is only on the table when affirmative action puts it, puts it there. Um, one of the claims that um, cr critics of affirmative action make is that it's a form of reverse racism. Exactly. And in your article, you offer a quite rigorous critique of that view. Would you explain that point? Well, um, I think it goes back to the point that I was just making. If, if um, we go back to sort of classic conceptions of equality, um, it's, equality doesn't only require that you treat likes alike, it also requires that you account for difference. Um, so um, one of the famous uh, quotes, which I hope I can call up right now, uh, from Anatoly France has to do with this question of, you know, the, the law in its great majesty treats the poor and rich alike and bans both from sleeping under the bridges. And I probably butchered the quote, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of neutrality in the law that says nobody can sleep under the bridge, but who is that going to affect? And so what I was trying to say about the claims of reverse racism relate to the question of <clears throat> treating all, uh, treating the question of taking race into account in all circumstances as though it is racism. When in fact, in order to avoid racism, sometime one needs to take race into account. Um, and so the conceptual problem, I think again, goes back to this notion that we, and I get it, I mean, I think that part of the narrative around these cases has often pitted people that seem to be at the bottom of the social, uh, of the social um, order against each other. Uh, and the people at the top of the chain are off to the side, sort of watching this debate uh, or watching this uh, dispute and sometimes, honestly, quite honestly, feeding off of that dispute um, in ways that preserve their privilege, uh, but don't allow for us to actually think about a broader set of questions, which is how might actually addressing the questions of racial equality open up the door for other kinds of things? If we think about the history of social movements in this country, we can see that the black liberation struggle, going back to the anti-slavery movement, was the um, catalyst for many other social movements, for questions of women's rights, for issues relating to even the rights of immigrants, to a whole host of things that were ultimately about challenging the inequitable distribution of power and resources in the country. And the idea that uh, we are locked in a zero-sum game is one that I think um, we constantly have to contest, but um, it, it, I think, relates to why I believe that part of the issue has to do with challenging the notion that the, that the way things are is the only way things can be. So uh, uh, you have also played a, a role in the historic transformation of South Africa, a very good place where um, the idea that the way things are isn't necessarily the way they always have to be. Would you tell us a little bit about the work you did in South Africa and, uh, and the development of uh, South Africa's first democratic constitution? Yeah, I, w I would like to say that I had a, a big role, but I guess what I would say is I was very fortunate to be part of a witness, uh, uh, I guess I would say witness and supporter and participant in South Africa's own organic democratic process, but um, during that period when I, as I mentioned before, I started teaching uh, in the late 80s, I had been doing a lot of work on the um, sanctions movement in South Africa, and I was fortunate enough in um, early 1991 to be part of a delegation of progressive lawyers, both black and, and, um, and others, that were invited to South Africa by the then um, a working group of South African lawyers that were thinking about what their new constitution should be. And to be quite candid, I think what had been happening was they had been getting a lot of uh, 
assistance from um, very well-funded and I think very well-meaning um, delegations coming from Europe, coming from um, the United States that had talked about different models of constitution making. And what they wanted to hear from was about people who had a real deep appreciation of some of the contradictions of the American constitutional model. And we were happy to provide it. <laughs> uh, we, 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 and um, it was out, actually out of that conference, I was on a panel talking about affirmative action, that I started the work on whiteness as property because I was trying to come up with a way in a 20 minute, 25 minute presentation to explain the morass of uh, uh, affirmative action jurisprudence in the United States. And um, so that uh, meeting, uh, that set of meetings in 1991, became very central to a set of dialogues that emerged over the ensuing three years leading up to the new constitution in 94, in which we both hosted um, some of our colleagues from South Africa and the US, and we were hosted there to basically just try to assist them as they work through, because these things were often a questions of political power. They weren't just questions of text on paper. Mm -hmm. But uh, we wanted to try to give them the best um, information and insights that we could based on our own history. Um, and I, I'm happy to say that the South African Constitution, as well as the decisions of the South African Constitutional Court, remain some of the most, I guess I would say, forward thinking in terms of contemporary um, constitutional law across the globe. Yeah. Fascinating. So we just have a couple of minutes left. This will be my last question. Sure. You have published poetry. Your son is a successful rapper. Why is poetry an important thing? I'm, a, I'm an English professor, so uh, you know I, uh, it makes me happy when I find people that are poets. Uh, say a little bit about how you view the importance of poetry. I, I think that poetry is a voice of the heart. And I think of it as um, I don't write much poetry these days. Most of what I write is um, in other voices. But uh, I don't mean to that to say that it's, it's all about the emotion. When I, and I don't mean it to say that it's all only just about the individual. But I think that poetry requires us to um, listen in ways that uh, involve all of ourselves, our collective memories, our communities are uh, in every way. And in that respect, I think of it as a, a, a way of establishing an important kind of connection that oftentimes uh, we miss because the world is so cluttered and so noisy. Um, but it, it, it taps into, I think, a kind of really critical voice that we all recognize when we hear it. Music is poetry in another form. Uh, and actually works without the words. <laughs> but I, I think of it in, in, as being crucial to, um, crucial to living and crucial to developing our ability to imagine a different world. On that, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. It's been a real pleasure. I've been speaking with Cheryl Harris, the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the UCLA School of Law. Harris gave the UO School of Law's Derek Bell Lecture on February 19, 2019. Her talk, titled Affirmative Action Chronicles from the Era of Colorblindness to White Nationalism, was part of this year's African American Workshop and Lecture Series. Thanks so much for watching.